Do you have more than one Raspberry Pi? Do you have a growing collection of power supplies or Raspberry Pis or 5 volt devices? Well, stay tuned and I'm going to show you a way to make this all much more manageable. Welcome to another edition of Tech Bytes with Ron Nutter, your home for all things relating to smart home technology. In this episode, we're going to talk about setting up a scalable power supply for the Raspberry Pi and other smart home devices. Hi, I'm Ron Nutter and we're going to be working on this together. This content is also available as an Amazon flash briefing or podcast. Please go to techbyteswithronnutter.com for more information. For any items mentioned in this episode, there are affiliate links available. If you click on these, I will get a small commission, but that won't affect the price you pay for the item. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please click on subscribe now and enable notifications. If this video helps you or provides value, please click on that like button, thumbs up. Here's what we're going to be covering. And this is going to be setting up on a scalable power supply. First, I'm going to tell you about how the problem snuck up on me. And then two, how I started to deal with it. And then a scalable option that I've got the parts on order for right now. And then the one elephant in the room that I'm not talking about is PoE or power over Ethernet. And then I'll tell you why. Well, I'm going to be honest with you up front. This problem snuck up on me. Part of it, uh, I saw it coming, but I went. I was in a state of denial. And that was when I got my first Raspberry Pi. Okay, I had one, not a problem. Well, then is you can appreciate that one became two. The two became three. And I think you see where this one's going. And it just became a real pain. And I was using every outlet I could find. And it just, I knew there had to be a better way. Well, this is what I got started with or something very close to this. And the key thing here is you'll notice all of, whoops, I got to learn to point the other way, all of the outlets that are on there and they're, some are vertical, some are horizontal. And that helps save some outlet real estate because we all know, depending on the power supply you get, whether it's one from the Raspberry Pi Foundation or if it's a third party one, you're going to lose an outlet or two and maybe more depending on the outlet strip you've got. So the next thing I had to go find, and it was a little harder than I thought, but I guess not that many people need it, is a one foot power extension, or as I'll affectionately refer to it as the wall ward extender. Because we know those, even if the ones that are fairly small are still going to be a little bit bulky and you got to worry about the where they run the cable and all that. So this helps a little bit. So depending on whether you've got the Raspberry Pi 3B power supply or the 4, and sometimes it's hard to tell until you get down into the micro USB or USB-C, that helps. So you've got a little bit more manageable. Now, something I would strongly encourage you to do if you go with this kind of solution is to get a inline on-off switch, and that's going to let you turn the power to a particular Raspberry Pi on and off without pulling and plugging back in the USB-C connector. And that is going to make a difference because those connectors are not meant for high levels of insertion and removal. And if you can just leave it alone and use the switch, then that's going to be that much easier for you. This scales a little bit. You still have to deal with a bunch of power supply routing, but it's an option and you can forego the usb C, or if there's one for a micro USB that you can power switch, that you can make that. that, that that's a nice to have. It's not a got to have. As you are installing your latest smart home device, grab a copy of my smart home checklist. This will help you record information about each device as you set it up. This will prove helpful when you need to find out where to get the firmware updates from or support on that device. You will be subscribed to my email list in exchange for the checklist. I won't share, rent, or sell your information to anyone. This is what I finally settled on and it's in transit right now. I had hoped it would be here today. Mm, don't know. It, it'll show up when it shows up. And that's a what's called a bench power supply. Now, for those of you that have a ham radio background, you're used to a slightly different flavor of this one. That one's just a standard 12 volts and you buy it in like a 20 or 30 amp, maybe a 40 amp variety. This one's a little bit different. You'll notice the dials down there at the bottom and that allows you to dial the amount of voltage and amperage. So I'm going to set this at five volts, which means even though this is rated for 30 volts and the, the model number you can see on the screen says HM310. Well, the three is for 30 amps. I'm sorry, the three is for 30 volts. I'll let me rephrase that. And 10 is for 10 amps. 
this is going to be something that is i tried finding one that was 20 amp but they just wasn't having a lot of luck with it in the search and this is about 70 dollars so for the most part i'm just going to sit on five volts and as i bring up new raspberry pis and this applies to other five volt devices whether you've got the arduinos or the the beagle bones or you name the flavor of a uh, single board computer this is going to be something that is definitely going to make your life a little bit easier in terms of routing power now the next thing you're going to want to do and this is something that I knew early on that I wanted to do is I'm going to fuse every individual device coming in. And that may sound like overkill, even though I'm talking five volts, but trust me, five volts can do just as much damage, just takes it maybe a little bit longer. So as you can see where the lines are coming from the negative and positive poles on the bench power supply, and it goes to a corresponding terminal on either the top or the bottom of the fuse panel. And then as you wire it up, that those two groups of three uh, screws you see are the negative termination point. And then you'll tie in your positive terminal to whatever device you're powering. I'm going to try to come up with some sort of cable labeling system. But the thing that I liked about this is if the fuse is the problem, the Raspberry Pi isn't powering up, then you're going to have a light to one side of that fuse that if it comes on, yeah, good, a good indication that the power is not getting through because of a blown fuse. Now you can get more of these and there's a process I'm going to go through once I've got everything pretty much ready to wire. And that's going to be profiling the device I'm putting on the fuse panel because I want to see what kind of current draw it's going to have. Now, we all know with the Raspberry Pi 4Bs that you, it's recommended you have a power supply capable of th feeding three and a half amps. Well, at if you had a Raspberry Pi taking full power, you can see very quickly we'd barely be able to drive three of them. But that's a worst case situation. It is pendant, as far as my understanding is, and we're going to learn on this one together, that you have how much you have plugged into the Raspberry very high in terms of USB devices. The more you get plugged in, the more it's having to power. So it's going to have to pull more power from the power supply. And I'm going to document each one of the Raspberry Pis that I hook up. And we may find that I can power five, six, seven. That there's going to be a limit. And I understand that one. But at least we'll know about what point we need to quit. And my cut point's probably going to be at about, with what I can figure right now, 60 to 70% of the power supply capacity. Because I don't want to overdrive it. And the fact I'm already taking a 30 volt supply and dialing it down to five volt is going to help. So that's, it's going to keep it a little bit cooler and not going to have to work as hard. And you see where it says off on the, the screen, and that's where you can shut off the power supply to everything else. So you've got one master switch there short of turning off the power supply from the main power button. So it's tomato, tomato, but at least you've got some ways to deal with it. You can stage the devices as they come up. You just not have the fuse pull put in where you're hooking up the device until you get everything cabled and then you should be able to just put the fuse in and go. I wouldn't think you'd have to turn off everything and that's I, that's what I'm hoping not to do. But uh, there again, that's where the USB-C or micro USB inline power switch might not be a bad thing to have. That would still give you an, an individualized method of being able to turn power on and off to a specific device. Now to the elephant in the room, PoE. And that's something that I looked at. There are two types of PoE hats that you can put on on top of a Raspberry Pi, as well as one you saw me review in an earlier video. The challenge there is you're looking at, well, figure 20 to $25 per Raspberry Pi. So if you've got four, four Raspberry Pis, you're talking $80 right there. Then you're going to have to go out and get a PoE or power over Ethernet capable switch that can drive all that. Some of your PoE switches will only handle, uh, I've seen them as low as about 60 watts. Well, that may not get you a whole lot because keep in mind, PoE from the experience I've had with it is basically meant to power phones. So most of the consumer type PoE switches are not going to have that beefy of a power infrastructure. And this is where I like to have PoE separate from the switch in some cases, because I've had PoE power supplies fail in a switch, but the switch still be functional. So that's something else to, to keep in mind is you've got $20 for each Raspberry for additional an additional component you're going to, have to put into it. And then they've got isolating versus non-isolating. And trust me, you want isolating because if something happens with PoE going into that PoE hat for the Raspberry Pi, you want there to be some isolation so that it doesn't take out one or more of 
the Raspberry Pi boards you've got, and then you've got the cost of the switch. So for example, if we did five Raspberry Pis, you're looking at another $200. Well, the solution I'm looking at here may scale very well past that, and I'm looking at an outlay to drive five Raspberry Pis of about $100 or a little bit over. And there's something we're going to have to do with the power supply that I'll show you when we start getting those wired up. But I wanted you to kind of have a feel for what I've run across because if you're getting multiple Raspberry Pis, then this is definitely going to be something that you're going to need to, to think about ahead of time so you don't have a unhappy spouse or kids getting playing in the wires when they really shouldn't even though you've told them not to. I mean, let's face it, kids are going to be kids. That's where I'm going and I needed to give you a little bit more explanation than I may be able to give you in the video where we hook up the lab power supply situation because this is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be using some connectors that crimp onto the cable and just to make things a little bit easier hopefully get rid of uh, some of the potential rat's nest that you're looking at if you're watching this on youtube you're going to see some videos on the screen that are similar to the one you've just watched or other content that youtube thinks you might be interested in if this video helps you or provides value please click on that like button thumbs up if you haven't already subscribed to the channel please click on subscribe now and enable notifications we'll see you in the next video thanks for watching